Plastic is bad, isn't it? Um, that definitely is the new consensus that we're being told. We're constantly being told to use less of it, whether it's The Guardian who challenged its writers to use less for a week, or if you listen to the archers like me, Fallon has gone for a plastic-free wedding. Um, <laughs> but uh, no wonder, though, no wonder there's been such a public outcry, though, because I think many of us were absolutely shocked and horrified to see some of the images on nature programmes, like the birds, uh, like the albatross, um, the albatross with its stomach full of plastic, or the whale washed ashore in Spain, its stomach filled with plastic waste. I don't know if people can see this, so that you probably don't want to look at it too long. Or, you know, the turtle trying to flee itself from a plastic bag. Or, if you like, the other programmes showing polystyrene trash floating over nature reserves. And I think all of these images, really, have acted as a wake-up call to the problem of plastic, and rightly so. But there is actually a contradiction here, because actually in many ways, plastic is an absolutely fantastic material. It's allowed for amazing advances in medicine, in hygiene, in food preservation, water transportation, and much, much more. And so the question really is, how have we ended up in a situation where such an amazing material is causing such harm? And what I want to do in this meeting is look really at what is plastic, a little bit of a brief history of it, why it's become such a problem, and what can be done about this. But I do think we have to start from a position that plastic doesn't exist in isolation, separate from everything else in the world. Because sometimes this is how it's pitched, isn't it? It's this moral issue that you as an individual have to deal with by giving it up. In fact, it's you as a consumer that's at fault to begin with for demanding and using all those plastic products and plastic bags and all that. And of course, there are things we can do and decisions we can make and we're going to look at some of those, but an approach that starts and ends with individual action turns reality on its head. Because plastic is part of a much bigger picture. In many ways, the story of plastic gets to the heart of capitalism. As we'll see, it's a byproduct of the fossil fuel industry, and it's become entrenched in the fossil economy of capitalism. And really, the central dynamics of capitalism, the drive for profit and competition, has driven its use even further. Um, so from the very beginning, vested interests have encouraged us to use more plastic. And even now, while they want us to cut, you know, on one hand they say we've got to cut down our plastic use, they're actually increasing production of plastic. But let's uh, go back to basics. What is plastic in the first place? The word plastic comes from the Greek word plasine, which means to mould or to shape. Now, plastics have the capacity to be moulded due to their molecular structure, which gives them special properties. They're actually, plastics are actually formed from what are called polymers. These are giant molecules made by linking together long chains of smaller molecules called monomers. Um, so they're basically like long, flexing chains of atoms, and they're put together in a repeating pattern to a giant molecule. Now, actually, plastic as we know it today is a really new material. It can trace its origins just back to the 19th century. And, of course, we tend to think of plastics as unnatural and synthetic. And, actually, today, just about all of uh, plastics are made from hydrocarbon molecules, which are packets of carbon and hydrogen derived from refining oil and natural gas. But these polymers, these long chains of atoms that I'm talking about, they do occur in nature as well. And in fact, the raw material for the earliest plastic, which was known as celluloid, was actually from a naturally occurring plant cellulose. And the story of it is actually quite interesting how it came into being, because it was developed in the 1800s as a replacement for ivory. Now, ivory, uh, like materials like tortoise shell and horn, um, share quite similar characteristics with plastic in terms of how they behave when heat or pressure are applied. You can mould them into other items and then set them. Things like tortoise shell combs were pursue, uh, um, produced in this way. And ivory in particular, during Victorian times, was used for a lot of things, especially billiard balls. And the, there was something like £1 million of ivory was being used every year. Uh, and there began to be a lot of worries that there would be an ivory shortage and elephants were going to be hunted to extinction. So in 1863, a billiard ball manufacturer took out an ad uh, offering a handsome fortune for an inventive genius who could come up with a suitable alternative for ivory to make billiard balls. So John Wesley Hyatt, he was an inventor, he saw this, and started to experiment. And he started to experiment with something that was known as gun cotton. Hi, comrades. Uh, is there seats here at the front for people? That might be good. Okay. 
So he began to experiment with gun cotton. And this is like a doughy mixture of nitric acid and cotton. And finally, a few years later, in 1969, Okay, so we're talking about the first invention here, which is trying to invent some billiard balls out of something that isn't ivory. So finally, he creates the material that is malleable and can be made as hard as horn, and it also can be moulded into shape and pressed paper thin and cut and sawed. And he created this from a natural polymer, the cellulose in cotton, but it had a versatility that none of the sort of natural plastics had had before. And it was called celluloid, which means like cellulose. And this was a very good uh, substitute for ivory. could make all things, apart from billiard balls, ironically, because it was such, it's made of gun cotton, and it was such a volatile material. When the balls hit each other, it was like a mini explosion. As a Colorado saloon keeper wrote, they didn't mind, but every time the balls collided, every man in the room pulled a gun. So this was not... <laughs> so, but it could be used for many things, and it was the first practical and commercial plastic. And one of its qualities, it could be made to use like other things, so it could look like ivory, tortoise shell, coral, lapis lazuli, or whatever. And it was much cheaper than those materials. It started to replace materials that were quite expensive. It meant more people could afford those products. It was also actually the base for photographic film. And um, celluloid uh, has been credited with leading to the birth of cinema. Despite all this, though, celluloid has a fairly modest place in the, in the material world of early 20th century. It was still very labour-intensive to use it, um, and like I said, it was a very volatile material. The factories were like tinderboxes. Really, the next plastic to be invented was Bakelite, and this is in 1907. People might have heard of Bakelite, actually. It was the first truly synthetic plastic forged in the lab, and this really paved the way for mass production. Again, another amateur inventor, Leo Bakerland, created it. And interesting, he was experimenting with coal tar, a waste product of coal in the coking process. Again, it's also interesting to note that the spur to invent this was to replace another natural material, something called shellac, which is a resin secreted by the female lac beetle, very good for electrical insulation, demand for this shooting up in the early 20th century. But it takes something like 15,000 lac beetles five months to produce one pound of shellac. So there was definitely more demand to invent it. And this is what was created. And it was infinitely more versatile than shellac as well. And it was different to, like I say, the celluloid. It didn't imitate natural materials. It had a distinct, if you like, plastic look. And it also lasted for a long time. My dad recently bought a Bakelite lamp. It's still going. So, you know, it lasts a long time. Uh, it could be moulded and machined into nearly everything. But it was also, like I say, a very good insulator and used in light fittings and electrical plugs. And this is really what opens the way for the development of synthetic plastics over the next half century. And really, like we say, in the 1920s and 30s, there's an outpouring of new materials from labs around the world. And interestingly, we'll come back to this, like we say, they're waste products from this newly emerging um, coal industry at the time with, with Bakelite, and actually then oil. And really, the discovery of the uses of oil at the beginning of the 20th century was transformative in many different ways. And we could talk about how the oil companies come into being in the 20s and 30s, building markets for petroleum as fuel, paving the way for mass production of cars. At the same time, the chemical industry was developing whole new products that were either made from the byproducts of oil refining or required the really high levels of energy that only oil could provide, or both of those things. And this was no longer the preserve of individual inventors. I've sort of talked about individuals tinkering away um, in their back gardens almost, really. It became big business uh, by the 1920s and was very much boosted, actually, by the US state during the First World War. Because actually before World War I, the US chemical industry actually mainly manufactured German-developed products under licence from companies like Bayer which were world leaders in the industrial chemistry. But one week before World War I ended, the US actually confiscated all the German patents under the Trading with the Enemy Act and then began licensing those to, at very low cost, to American firms. And this was actually what laid the basis for the rapid growth of US chemical companies, ones we've heard of DuPont, American Cyanide, Dow Chemical and Monsanto. 
And these corporations then went on to hire scientists and create their own research laboratories to invent on demand. Just to give you a scale of it, in 1920, there was 300 corporate laboratories in the US. By 1940, 2,200. A massive growth in this. And like I say, in the 1930s, plastics take off as a consequence of the growth of the oil and gas industries. And here, according to the legend, the story goes, John D. Rockefeller, there he was, looking out over one of his oil refineries, he notices all the flames flaring from the smokestacks and thinks, well, what is that burning? And someone says, oh, well, you know, we're burning off the ethylene gas. It's a product of the refining process. And he's like, I don't believe in wasting anything. Find out something to do with it. Now, whether it's true or not, it does actually sum up the origins of the modern petrochemical industry, the principle that every hydrocarbon taken from the ground can help turn a profit. And the something that Rockefeller demanded, was searching for that would turn a profit, turned out to be something called polyethylene. Actually, it was invented, well, discovered, if you like, in 1933 by two British chemists um, for Britain's imperial chemical industries. And they were trying to find a use for the waste gases in their industry, and natural gas is very rich in ethane, from which you get ethylene, from which they were able to turn into polyethylene. Polyethylene is really the most commonly used, or I'd say polymer, plastic in the world. The one that is more than any other, if you like, moulded the modern age of plastics. It's a material that is inexpensive, durable and pliable. And if you look now at the plastic industry, just two industrial chem chemicals, ethylene and propylene, which are, as I say, the byproducts of oil and gas industries, are the basis for 99% of all the plastics that are produced from fossil fuels. So it's quite clear how and why these giant oil companies of the time come to play a major role in this petrochemical industry. And most of today's producers of plastic do have their roots in the early decades of the 20th century. And they have like vertically integrated companies. It was made sense to co-locate, if you like, fossil fuel and plastic production in the same place. And so the largest players in each industry today, Dow DuPont, ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, BP, they're all integrated companies that produce both the fossil fuels and the plastics. So like we see here, plastics have taken off in the 1930s. But actually, it's the Second World War that completely transforms their use and paves the way for widespread plastic use in the post-war period. Because oil itself transformed, transformed the whole of warfare, but plastics did as well. And really kind of showcased, if you like, their versatility in the war. And they were very much helped again by the US government because it was their actions that ensured their use continued and expanded after the war. Um, so just look, for example, they I mentioned polyethylene, discovered by accident, a product of waste um, gases. They didn't actually know what to do with it when they discovered it, uh, but it turned out to be a great buffer of high frequencies and high voltages. And so it was used to insulate airborne radar, cable, uh, radar cables, which some argued helped you know, pilot so much it contributed to, to winning the war. Or you think of nylon, was used to replace silk parachutes. Acrylics were used for windows on bombers. Plastic helmets replaced the metal ones. And in a myriad of uses, plastics were used during the Second World War. In fact, used so much that the US government actually spent over $3 billion to build or expand the petrochemical plants during the Second World War to produce all this was needed. Things like the nitrogen for explosives, the synthetic rubber, the nylon, etc., the crucial thing here is, though, they put that massive investment in. After the war, the US government then sells all these really nicely newly invested in uh, plants at bargain basement prices to the companies. So a plant that was worth something like uh, $19 million was sold to Monsanto for $10 million. Uh, another big operation worth $38 million was sold to the pump for $13 million. So these companies were given, if you like, state-of-the-art you know, petrochemical and plastic facilities at bargain basement prices. And this giveaway really paves the age for plastics in the post-war period. And um, it really, as I say, the US manufacturing technology itself was completely revolutionised by these wartime demands and meant that it, things became much cheaper to produce as well. And as I say, plastic production has quadrupled during the war after the war, all that productive potential has to kind of go somewhere. And it, plastics explode into the consumer markets like never before. In fact, they foresaw that. Even in 1943, DuPont had a whole division preparing prototypes of housewares that could be made of plastics after the war would be ended. 
And so what you saw is all these materials, if you like, that are very durable and long-lasting that have been developed for the hardships of war are then turned into consumer products. So you think of something like styrofoam, as it's uh, known in the US. It's very buoyant, it's very insulating. It'd been used by the US Coast Guard for life rafts. Now it's going to be used for picnic cups and coolers. Or you think of the fact that polyethylene has this extraordinary capacity to insulate at high frequencies. That's over. It's got a new career bagging sandwiches and dry cleaning. You know, and this is what they saw. You know, the executives at the plastic companies said literally virtually nothing was made from plastic before, but anything could be. And actually vast profits could be made. And this is really how and when plastics begin to infiltrate, if you like, every part of our daily life entering our homes, our cars, our clothes, our playthings, our workplaces, even our bodies, actually. So they go from near non-existence from before the Second World War in consumer society to become massively used and a massive part of US uh, manufacturing. And this is what brings us to where we are today. Quite literally, drowning in plastic, especially when you look at some of the horrific uh, pictures. Um, according to a recent study in New Scientist, since the introduction of mass-produced plastics in the early 20th century, 8,300 million tonnes of the stuff has been produced. And this has kept rising. Just in 2014, another 311 million tonnes produced. If current trends continue, world production of plastic is going to double by 2035 and double again by 2050. Now, of course, one of the problems of plastic is that it's derived from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so it contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. The industry uses about 6% of global oil production. Not massive, but it's more than aviation, and the figure will increase to 20% by mid-century mid if we continue as business as normal. But also, um, reports out recently showed that actually emissions from greenhouse gases from the global plastic sector will account for 50% of the annual carbon budget by 2050, which will be up from 1% today if we carry on. But as we know, this is not the only problem. The major, major issue of plastic is that around three quarters of all the plastic produced has been thrown away. And 80% of that has been drifted into the environment or gone into landfill. And there's something like 150 million tonnes of plastic in our oceans already today. Eight million more tonnes a year ends up in the ocean. That's apparently five trillion different pieces. And they reckon by 2050, plastics in the ocean will outweigh all the fish. So it, it's not a surprise that people are horrified and have pledged to cut down their own plastics usage. And here it can seem very easy to blame mass consumerism and a disposable culture. We're just throwing our stuff away. I think it's worth exploring this a bit more. Because the first thing is that plastics and the products were not a response to consumer demand, like we, we've looked at here. In many cases, the petrochemical industry discovered these different types of polymers that could be produced from the waste products of the oil and gas industries. They had wide-ranging uh, properties, and then they had to find a use for them, and then they had to create a demand for them. And they did this in all sorts of ways. I mean, one example I came across was the discovery of uh, what's now marketed as silly putty. It was developed by scientists trying to create a synthetic rubber for the army in the early years of World War II. The military couldn't think of what to do with it, but an entrepreneurial toy store owner had a great idea. Let's turn it into silly putty. And this is just one example of many. And so, of course, this made sense, though, to them, doesn't it? They're using a waste product. It's very cheap, and you can make a profit by creating something new, even if, let's be honest, it's a pointless product in many ways. And this is also combined with, actually, a production method that actually encouraged large-scale production. I didn't mention it, but early on in plastic um, production, they moved to injection moulding. Now, the production it's method itself was quite expensive. You have to make a lot of a product to make sure it's economically viable. So it lends itself to mass production techniques. Therefore, each unit can then be quite cheap. So you've got this situation where the cheapness of the actual material, which of the basis of plastic, combined with the expense of the production method, fueled the creation of a lot of stuff, more than perhaps we actually needed. And therefore, it had to be marketed to us. And here there's a problem, because one of the key benefits of plastic is its strength, its durability, the fact that it can last for a very, very long time. Um, and that's a problem for the industry, isn't it? They don't want us to buy something once and then be done uh, and never have to buy it again. So they have to come up with new ways to make us buy more, want more and need more plastic. And this is what led to disposability and single-use plastic products. It was not an accident. 
Um, and it's not due to feckless consumers. It's something the industry experimented and promoted from the beginning. At a 1956 plastic conference, one of the you know, business people there told the audience of manufacturers, your future is in the garbage wagon. They were very clear about it. But disposability was something that had to be taught. Because actually, in the 1950s, just after the Second World War, disposable products were quite a hard sell to a generation that had come through the Depression and wartime, we used to make do and mend man mantra. You know, everything was reused and recycled, and people assumed if something was broken, you could repair it. Now, actually, plastics and the new materials did challenge that assumption. You actually can't just mend it in the same way. But even then, people, to begin with, were keeping hold of plastic. You know, in the 1950s, when they introduced vending machines, you know, for coffee and drinks, people saved the plastic cups because they thought, oh, we'll reuse them. <laughs> and they had to be educated not to. And there was massive media and advertising campaigns. And actually, we've had this up here. This picture here is of, if you can't see it very well, a man and a woman, a, sort of a, meant to be a, a couple and a family, um, amidst all this plastic. Now, this was a positive image on Life magazine, celebrating what it dubbed throwaway living. Uh, their arms are meant to be raised in exultation amid a downpour of disposable items, plates, cutlery, bags, ashtrays, dog dishes, pails, barbecue grills, everything. It calculated all the items would have needed 40 hours of cleaning, but now no housewife need bother. So it was a massive way of trying to... I mean, we'd look at that now and be horrified, but this was meant to be the, you know, the future. Um, so we were... This is... A lot of uh, work went into t getting us to dispose and use single-use plastic. And we did learn it quite well. I mean, today, half of all plastics that are produced go into single-use applications. So products that take hydrocarbons, millions of years in the making, can last for a millennia after, are designed only to be used once, actually designed, you know, disposable lighters, pens, razors, go through it all. Central to single-use plastic is packaging. This is the largest use of plastic. 26% of all production is for packaging. Products designed to be thrown away, paid for materials that are never going to die. Plastic bags have been the absolute you know, epitome of this, really. Again, a very recent invention. Only invented in the 1970s. Again, mobile oil at the heart of it. A Swedish uh, engineer had designed it. They bought the patent, introduced them in 1976. Not very popular at first. Shoppers didn't like them. I mean, you probably know when you're trying to get your plastic bag out of the roll, you have to lick your finger. Shoppers didn't really like having to lick their fingers when they're buying their food or the cashier doing that. So again, they had to do a very big incentive campaigns to get the stores to use them and shoppers to use them. Eventually it won out because they pitched the price cheaper than paper bags. OK. It's quite a bleak picture here. What are we going to do about all this? Well, there is the question that's come through about recycling. Because obviously one way of trying to limit the amount of plastic ending up in our oceans is to recycle more of it. And it is shocking how little is actually recycled now. I think something like of all plastics, just 14% is collected for recycling around the world, much less actually uh, re, uh, reprocessed. Um, something like... <sighs> When it comes to plastic packaging, again, 14% collected for recycling, uh, only a third of that, like 5% of all production, is actually recycled. 14% burned, 40% to landfill, 32% enters the environment as pollution. And by the way, it ends up in our oceans, often from travelling through rivers. And this is very shocking, because in fact, plastic is very recyclable. Technically, it all could be recycled. Uh, things like... Um, you might have seen the word PET, which is uh, what plastic bottles are made of. It's uh, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, actually, this is very recyclable. But globally, 50% of it is collected for recycling, but only 7% turned into new bottles. But partly, it's because sometimes economically, it's not worth it for manufacturers. You know, sometimes it, it seems cheaper to just start afresh. One of the big problems, though, as well, is it's not helped by the lack of uniform recycling facilities. And we can just look in Britain between different areas and in that way. Now, it's interesting. Up until about last year, we used to send a lot of our waste plastic to China. In fact, all the world sent it to China just about for recycling. China has stopped this now. Uh, it's not going to take any more of this. And you might think, well, this is a bit of an opportunity to rethink our recycling in Britain. Now, I think I'm right in saying this. Um, it was something that I listened to on a documentary, that there are some new you know, infrastructure projects in the pipeline for, in Britain 
But actually, out of 12, only one or two mention recycling. All the others really focus on the idea of recovering energy from the waste, which actually means burning it. So there are problems here. And like I say, there's a real mix between different local authorities and recycling um, facilities. Um, it's not always straightforward because there are different types of plastic and you have to ensure food grade plastic is kept separate from other sorts. So, you, know, you need to think about how it is sourced and recycled. What's quite bad is that I think some local authorities actually still sort it by hand. Um, I think that some of that does happen. But it's possible to have amazing state-of-the-art. In Southwark, they do actually have an amazing state-of-the-art um, recycling centre. And even with the different types of plastic, they shine infrared light at it. It comes back telling them what sort of plastic it is. Air jets then used to shoot off a different plastic to different parts, and it can be recycled. They can even recycle plastic bags there. Now, I actually think probably most people in Southwark don't know that, but it's definitely not the case everywhere that can do it. But it shows kind of what is possible there, really. Um, the other thing is, though, is that um, there can be other solutions that also impact, if you like, on recycling. Because people may have heard of, and we can maybe want to discuss it more, bio and biodegradable plastics. Now, these are not to be consumed, uh, confused. They are two different things. A uh, bioplastic is plant-based, it's not synthetic, it's not from fossil fuels. Biodegradable plastic is meant to degrade. can be confusing because some bioplastics from plants don't degrade and some biodegradable uh, ones are made from fossil fuels. But even then, biodegradable plastic can be a problem because it's made to biodegrade not to be recycled, so if it gets in the recycling streams, that can then be a problem. And actually, I think there's some false marketing of biodegradable plastic from a lot of people I know. It doesn't actually biodegrade that well, and it, or it breaks into even smaller pieces, which are a very big problem in our oceans in that way. And as I say, some of the plant-based ones being developed, they may not come from um, you know, uh, the oil and gas industry as a byproduct, but they don't degrade at all, and you've still got the problem of plastic being around for a long time. These are all things you have to think about there. Also, I just want to throw it in there. That it can be quite difficult because there is also the bigger total environmental impact of anything that's made in terms of energy use and efficiency. You see, I think it is right to replace plastic bags, and I think it's good to use tote bags, and you can buy these ones from bookmarks, um, and I think it is good to carry them. But apparently, you know, in, in terms of a normal tote bag, you'd have to use it 131 times before the whole environmental cost would be, you know, outweigh a single-use plastic bag. Same with steel water bottles, I'm for these. But again, you'd have to use them maybe 500 times, according to a new scientist recently, before the carbon footprint is less than a disposable pet bottle. So sometimes there are some quite big questions out there about how our resources are used and also about how the total environmental impact um, is there. And, you know, all of this, of course, is very cynically manoeuvred and things around the plastic companies. Actually, one of their campaigns was, yes, yes, let's, come, let's get people to recycle more because then actually they won't feel so bad about using it and carry on buying more plastic because they just think it's all being recycled. And there can be, you know, quite uh, like similar uh, cynical ploys in this way. But at heart, we can recycle all we want and we should and we should fight for better recycling facilities. But to be effective, it's got to replace virgin plastic. And this is now... A central problem, isn't it? Because this is what we want to do. We want to cut our plastic use, therefore we want to cut production. The big multinationals of the fossil fuel industry, they're planning to increase plastic production and they want us to consume more. And here you have to see the totality of the system. You see, it, it, because it's locked into the fossil fuel industry, 99% of plastic coming as a byproduct, just think about the impact of fracking and the shell revolution in the US. Actually, what it's led is to very cheap natural gas. There's a glut of it. And this has meant actually fueled more plastic production. It's actually, I mean, it's actually quite difficult, for example, to transport uh, the ethane at sort of very low temperatures. But it was worth them investing and making these massive ships that can transport the shale gas from the US around the world to places like Ineos in Grangemouth, because then uh, it's now worth it because it's so cheap to make more plastic in that way. And this has led to a plastics bonanza. Just a few years ago, the industry, according to Plastic News magazine, said shale-based natural gas represents a once-in-a-generation opportunity for the North American plastics market. 
They had a three-day summit of all the oil, gas, petrochemical and plastics industries, and they said they were going to address the opportunities and challenges of a coming renaissance in North American plastics. So they're very clear. This is an opportunity for them. And only last year, I think it was, that it was announced that by 2023, the chemical industry will have spent $164 billion on 264 new facilities or expansion products in the US alone. And like I say, I mentioned in the Austin shipping it to it, you know, there was actually in 2016, the first shale gas from the US arrived there. There was a, a great, you know, furore about it, and rightly that it came from fracking, but actually, they forget often to mention on the news, it's going to be making plastic. And again, Ineos representatives were on the news in the last few weeks talking about how they're going to increase their plastic production. You see, China, as I said, has stopped taking the world's plastic to recycle. And they said this was for environmental concerns. And they didn't want to take the world's waste. Well, fair enough. But really, actually, they want to increase their own production of plastic. It might be more profitable for them to make their own virgin plastic and then recycle their own. And there's been all of the pro uh, new projects in the pipeline. I think the Trump administration did a deal with Saudi Arabia. And so global plastic production is set to increase to, um, just plastic bottle production alone by 20% in the next uh, five years. And so more and more, if you like, of this fossil fuel infrastructure is being created and the logical use is to use the waste products and make more plastic. So what are we can do? We're up against this whole system. As much as we want to reduce plastic, they want us to get us to use more. Actually, I think the public outcry has been important. It has had an effect when people saw the horrific pictures we showed of the whale and the birds and what's going on and people watch Blue Planet. Um, the UK has got a plastics pact where it says that companies responsible for 80% of plastic used in the UK, they've pledged to make 100% of plastic packaging to be recyclable, reusable and compostable and to eliminate all single-use plastic packaging by 2025. Good. And my understanding of this is a voluntary, though. I don't think it's enforced in law. The EU that is preparing a ban on single-use plastics, including cutlery, straws and plates... Um, good. I think it's good that we have campaigns. We should have campaigns for much better recycling facilities across local authorities in lots of different ways. Partly as well because we should be collectivising our response rather than putting it onto individuals to try and make these difficult decisions when it's being thrown at us from all angles. And you see, I think it is right. I think we should try and reduce our plastic use. I think we should try and reuse more plastic. I th think we should recycle it. But I don't think that happens in a vacuum on our own without the facilities to do that. And actually, the way life and society is created that, makes, that locks in capitalist uh, um, plastic use in every way. And that's why I don't think you can separate out if you like, the fight against plastic from other wider fights. Some of that around climate change, the bigger questions of taking on the fossil fuel industries, you know, we're for the idea fossil fuels should stay in the ground, but also from wider movements as well that challenge capitalism as a whole. Because actually we have to think about how do we have a very different society that would rationally think, how do we use the resources? How do we use really incredible resources in a way that has the least damage on our environment and the most use to the most people? That requires a different sort of world where we start planning and thinking about what we need and what's good for the environment rather than actually what turns a profit. And that means not isolating the plastic fight on its own, making it part of the much bigger fights that we're all part of that actually challenge the massive vested interests and multinationals that want us to keep using more and more of this stuff. Thanks very much for that, Amy. Um, obviously, this is a, a question which is very live in the media and so forth at the moment, but it's been an issue for a long time that just hasn't been getting talked about. I think I want to start kind of where Amy ended. I, for my sins, I grew up in America. I, before I became a revolutionary socialist, I started taking an engineering degree, and I was so stubborn that I finished it in chemical engineering, and I went and worked for General Electric mm -hmm. Silicone's division in Waterford, New York, the world's largest silicone production facility, where they made 3,200 plus different types of products, everything from the O-rings that failed on the space shuttle to emulsifiers which bulk up the condiments that you eat on your uh, hamburgers and hot dogs from Jan's meeting last session. So you're eating the polymers because they're cheaper than the food that they're bulking up, for example. So if you wonder how polymers get inside fish, it's the same way they get inside us, because we eat them because they're cheaper than the food. Why are they cheaper than the food? Because Tory governments and people like Theresa May and so on are best friends with people like Jim Ratcliffe, R-A-T, rat by name, rat by nature, <laughs> Ineos, 
which is the largest producer of plastics in the UK. He also owns the Grange Mouth Oil Refinery. He also lives on a 120 million pound yacht so that he doesn't pay any taxes. A few years ago, he locked out the workers at Grange Mouth, Scotland's only oil refinery, where you have the refining of oil for the use in fuels, but also, as Amy said, directly adjacent uh, plastics manufacturing facility. He locked out the workers, he blackmailed the Westminster and Scottish parliaments, and what did they do? They didn't do what we asked them to do, which is to nationalize the Grange Mouth refinery, Scotland's only way of refining its uh, crude oil, which is extracted in the North Sea. They paid the ransom. 60 million pounds from Westminster and 60 million pounds from the Scottish Parliament went into uh, Jim Ratcliffe's pocket to build a tank to hold fracking gas. But we didn't stop there, so we went to the communities and we built anti-fracking campaigns everywhere. They put a road show on where they lied about fracking and how clean it is and you could drink the water that comes back up and all this shit. And we beat them and we got a moratorium against fracking in Scotland. So we can't use, we can't use the fracking gas at the moment. We've got to stay on top of that. Mm -hmm. But it's because the governments make these voluntary things, which make them sound good. The mm -hmm. Tories are very green when they mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. But they're full of shit. Most of the plastic that's being used is made in a way that is difficult to recycle. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Something like three million packets of crisps are consumed in the UK every year. The crisp packet is made of plastics, but it's also made of aluminium foil. Mm. It's also it's layers and layers of different materials, all glued and heated together. So you cannot recycle it by design. It's mm. called designed obsolescence. It's what Amy so was what referring to. Me. So you throw it away instead of reusing it. We need plastics for some things in life, like catheters and medical uses. There are things that polymers can be used for that other things at the moment, as far as we know, can't. But we should keep it for those specific things, and we should nationalize the research and development and the production of these things and put it in the public interest of what we need and the interest of the environment is in our interest as ordinary working class people. And Sum up, therefore, please, socialism is the way to drive innovation that actually serves the environment in a sustainable way and serves the needs of people. Thank you. I'm Bob Parks. I'm in Southampton SWP. Two points. One, I'm also in Friends of the Earth. And I'm doing, we've got the main uh, exhibit at the New Forest Show this year. And what I've, I've done, I've had a head cast taken and a cast of my hand. And the... Uh, I've got my hand coming out of the mouth. It's a horror representing a horror, which is obviously plastic straws in the ocean. But it's represented. It's um, I've got a plastic straw in the uh, in my hand, and that will go on exhibit. And around, the, I've got it on one of these cheap Doric plastic furniture columns, and it'll go on exhibit. And the participation will be. We've collected from all the local schools thousands of plastic straws is to stick them all around the base of it, so it'll uh, make a very good, strong installation. The second point I wanted to make is a, an expansion of these ideas, because um, uh, working into consciousness, because um, the, the metaphor of, uh, uh, of waste products like coal tar producing Bakelite can serve as a metaphor which has fueled my life. I was one of the first performance artists in England. I had a television program about my life, which is going to be re-televised on the 20th of July at 1.30 on uh, BBC4. But what, what uh, I've been working with is the idea of uh, stress and anxiety. As a, well, anxiety is a byproduct of stress. Now, just as coal tar, which was thought to be a, uh, 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 a waste product, fueled the whole petrochemical chemical industry, my theory is that anxiety fuels consciousness, but we, as, as things are going into internal space now with uh, computer technology, I think this is a way forward and an application of some of the uh, uh, possibilities of, of plastics. Thank, Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, my name's James, I come from uh, North Derbyshire, and North Derbyshire and South Yorkshire and North Nottinghamshire are now on the front line of the battle against fracking, particularly the battle against INEOS. INEOS are the key fracking uh, company in our area, 
And Amy said that pl the plastics industry developed as a byproduct of the uh, uh, of uh, the fossil fuel industry. Actually, in Ineos's case, uh, it's working the other way around. It's not that it's a byproduct. Ineos are specifically fracking in order to uh, produce ethane to use for plastic production. This is the main purpose of their fracking. I've just spent the last two weeks in a public inquiry of our local anti-fracking campaign because our local council refused Ineos a uh, license to drill. They've appealed to the uh, to the, uh, uh, the planning inspectorate. There was a local uh, uh, planning inspectorate campaign. I've had to spend two weeks in the room with Ineos, which is not a pleasant place to be. And at that uh, meeting, they, the standard argument they need to put forward to fracking, we need fracking to keep the lights on. It's a complete, utter lie. They want fracking in order to, in order to simply uh, produce ethane to, uh, to produce more plastic. That, they've said in their business plan that's what all the ethane they're going to get out of the ground in our communities is going to go to more plastic uh, production. I think that's an important, uh, important argument. And I think what it does is it gives us another important uh, 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 argument to, to, to deploy, the sorts of arguments Amy's gone through about the, the extent of you know, the, the consciousness there is now of a, of a plastic. It's an important part of our armory uh, uh, against the frackers. I think we can use that argument, uh, uh, argument uh, abs uh, absolutely uh, at the heart of it. So I think for the anti-fracking campaign, uh, the art of plastics production is going, to, is going to be one of those sort of key key uh, drivers in, ha in how that campaign uh, develops. And the other thing to say about Jim Ratcliffe, of course, is, is also, as you'll see in the article in the Financial Times, is also number one on the guest list for dinner with Trump uh, mm -hmm. uh, next weekend. <laughs> so uh, all the more reason to, uh, to campaign against Ineos, who are absolutely at the heart. They are, they are absolutely in at the cutting edge of this, of what we're discussing today, mm. and they're one of the key enemies, and I think the more we focus attention on them and, and beat them back, the better. Mm. Thank you. Um, I've studied the last two years at Capel Manor College, which is the horticultural college based in Enfield, and I studied the first-hand you know, effects of um, plastic, um, so obviously a lot from what happened in the oceans, uh, the animals and all that as well. But I also looked at other alternatives on why we can use um, plastic. So plastic bottles is the number one, uh, one of the number one most recycled uh, or thrown out plastics there is. So what can we do or use with plastic bottles? One, one, of, them, sorry. one of them would possibly be uh, greenhouses. Now bottles uh, create a perfect heat resource for plants and I've seen it in one video where people stick bottles you together so I'll speak a bit louder um, that's it um, so basically um, so you stick the bottles together to basically create this greenhouse and when it in the sun and it helps grow the plants and that will be year after year after year but that's only one thing i've seen a video of a guy who lived who made his own island from plastic bottles in the uh, in the ocean now how how did he do that so basically he collected all the plastic bottles put them into like um bag netting and then uh, put it onto the, the sea, so you needed quite a lot of that, about, got a good, <laughs> about 3,000 bottles into big bags, and then he put a bit of sand, a bit of soil, more bags of bottles, and that keeping the island afloat with all the layers as well of um, organic matter, and then he used trees that just mainly, mainly grow on water, and they grow un through the soil and the sand, in and the roots go through the bottles. And that keeps the entire island together. So he built a house on the island. He had a compost toilet, a shower <laughs> made uh, for rainwater. And it, 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 it shows the, the mo many, many alter positive alternatives we can use. Now, I'm not asking you to make an island <laughs> in the middle of plastic <laughs> bottles. You know. You know, no, I'm not asking that. But... Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it just shows the possibility, you know, and obviously there's recycling as well. So there's another obvious, get your neighbours to encourage more on recycling or create art from plastic, plastic, art sculptures. That's another wonderful thing. So there's many, many um, wonderful options, you know. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. I think that's one of the things that really strikes me about this whole, that the guy there was talking about, you know, really 
interested in inspiring ideas. And what, you know, I, I, and I've just to go back to what I was going to say, I'll get back to that again if I remember, um, was that, you know, that's, the, that's what the things that, that really, that, that I think is really good about this is that people are coming up with ideas. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that, um, that, that capitalism basically uh, makes everything into small amounts. You know, it, 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 uh, it, it doesn't join the dots. And that's the thing, that's, that's why I think that, it's interesting about all these ideas because it, and, and all the pressure that people put on uh, on the uh, on the on governments to, to do something and companies to do something is important because that's how we solve the problem. It's it's not about you know I think it's important that we do all recycle etc cetera, etc, cetera, but because that made that I think that the one reason why that's important is because it put it, it means that we have got like a, a dog in the fight if you want that we feel like we feel impa impassioned about this. Because we can see a problem, we're doing something about it, and we expect the big people to do something about it. And that, uh, that's a problem, I think, with a lot of you know, people in, in, in the movement do, doing things. It is trying to blame the individual. And I don't think blaming the individual, A, doesn't do anything, but actually doesn't solve the problem. The problems are too, too big. You know, if someone's making a positive island out of plastic, that's one thing. But we all, I think we're all shocked to see that island that has actually just grown up from waste plastic. And the fact that we're, we're ingesting this stuff. Who, I don't remember. Do, do you remember the referendum when we voted to uh, ingest plastic for, you know, in our food? No, well, none of us knew this until somebody sort of blurted it out. You know, and all the plastic crumb that's around and et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's the trouble. There's a lack of plastic. plastic there's a lack of transparency over plastic. I just realised it. <laughs> well, and that's one of the problems where... But, you know, plastic can be made in other ways, obviously. The, and, and, and Amy talked about that. But then someone's got to think about if we're going to use food sources in order to make plastic, actually what happens to food production? What happens there? Because in a lot of countries, the problem with capitalism is it's forced, um, it's forced people, particularly in developing countries, to grow products not to feed their own people, but to send out to the, to the developed world. And that's what I think. Is as, a, as a socialist and revolutionary, I think it's important that we as individuals do something about it. But actually what we need to do is put pressure on the, on the, on the, on the big people to, to make the big decisions because there's no doubt that, there is the, that there's all the ideas in the world that we could come up with to do something about this. But all it comes down to is, does it make money? And that's one of the problems with plastic is it is not profitable to recycle it. So that's why it doesn't get recycled. And in Sheffield, sorry, I'm stopping. In Sheffield, we had a scandal where all the plastic that was going into our recycling was being burnt and incinerated because it wasn't making enough money for the company that was supposed to recycle it. And that's what we need to get angry about because if we don't get angry, actually nothing will happen. And we need to take over this system so that we, it doesn't work for the profits of a few people. It works for, for our benefit and for our future. I just wanted to re-emphasize a key point that Amy makes in her talk, which is that the crisis that we have with plastics, and it is an absolute crisis, is a result not of an error by, uh, by companies or a mistake by governments. It's a result of the way that f capitalism has developed with fossil fuel at its absolute core, because it's the needs of the fossil fuel industry that led at a particular point in capitalism's history in the Second World War, immediate post-Second World War period, for them to develop plastics as something to, to buy and to sell and to make profits from, and then, uh, and, and then to increase... Uh, increased production for it. And it became, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, an absolute drive of American capitalism in particular to use plastics as much as possible. There's a lovely cultural example of it in the Dustin Hoffman film, The Undergraduate. If you remember, Dustin Hoffman's character, right at the beginning of the film, is having an ex existential crisis about what he's going to do. And this rich business com man comes up to him at a tea at a party and says to him, I've got one word for you, plastics. And it uh, emphasises this sense that a section of, the uh, of, the, of business saw plastics as being the profitable way forward, uh, uh, irrespective of what they might, uh, uh, they might uh, uh, take by. And that coincides with a period in American capitalism where uh, 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 a single use, uh, uh, re uh, uh, replacement of products uh, year in, year out, becomes an absolute 
central part of their business model. And, you know, everybody from car industries to cigarette manufacturers started to see how can we stop having single-use stuff and having repeated stuff that forces people to buy and buy and buy again over and, uh, and, uh, and over. And then they reckon they have an immediate problem, which is the waste problem. So what they then do is they invent a waste industry to blame <coughs> consumers who aren't, uh, aren't disposing of it properly, to take the blame off them, to take the heat off them themselves. And that's why I think the question of recycling is a double-edged sword, because we do want to recycle, but actually that takes the blame to a certain extent off the, uh, the people who are churning this stuff out over and over again. I mean, you know, where, where I live, the city where I live, the, the council is quite happy to fine people for not putting bottles in the, uh, in the right places, but even if everybody did put the bottle in the right bin and it was recycled, it doesn't deal with the problem of all the corporations that are man producing so, so much stuff. And capitalism has recognised this to a certain extent. One of the reasons companies like Coca-Cola have made commitments to making pla uh, only using recycled uh, plastics is because it's a problem for the system as a whole. Why did China ban the uh, import of plastic waste to stop the recycling? It wasn't because they were being environmentally friendly. It's because there's huge pressure inside China from working people and middle class people to say there's too much plastic, we can't deal with it. So the company, the co government said, we'll, we'll have to deal with our own problems first. And that's led to an enormous glut of plastic. And as the comrade from Sheffield said, the Br uh, the Br in Britain, not, there's not enough recycling capacity to deal with it, so it's incinerated and burnt. And the logical consequence of this is that if we are to deal with that pollution question, we have to have a, pr a, a strategy that challenges the corporations and the companies and the system, not just uh, emphasising recycling. There's too much blaming of the individuals. They're not enough pointing a finger at the corporations and the companies that are causing the problem. When, uh, when that first guy made his contribution about the crisps made of plastic and aluminium, I heard a radio programme about that. And in fact, the aluminium hasn't got any necessary function. It's not to keep the crisps fresh. The reason they, uh, they put the aluminium in is to give it a crackle mm -hmm. because they've realised that people don't buy crisp packets if there isn't a crackle. So it's purely uh, to, uh, to create need. Um, and another radio programme I was listening to, they were talking about uh, the, poisonous, the poison, uh, poison air that we got, particularly in London, which if you've come from outside London you'll really notice this weekend. Uh, and one of the reasons for the poison is the lead in petrol. And again, uh, the lead in petrol uh, is not necessary. But when they were creating the motor industry to start with, um, they discovered that it was far cheaper, rather than making engines that didn't need lead in petrol, it was far cheaper to put the lead in petrol uh, because, of course, that, that increased profits. And it's been known since Victorian times that lead poisons people. But, of course, profits were number one. And I think this is, this is the, the key point, really, is that these companies are driven by the need for profit and they need to make short-term profit. So they have an obligation, first and foremost, to generate profits, to generate dividends for shareholders. And they're not wicked people, but that is the, that is the reason why these corporations exist and that is the, the, the motor of the system. And there is a technological solution to all of these issues. I mean, the idea about plastic islands I thought was wonderful. And there are loads of really imaginative technological solutions. But as long as those solutions don't generate a profit, uh, then they're not going to go anywhere. And I think the, the critical thing to recognise is that as socialists, as revolutionaries, we recognise that to save the planet, the next 20 years are critical and we need socialist revolution so that we can overthrow capitalism and we can have a system that actually puts the planet and puts people first and puts profits out of the picture. Hi, uh, my name is Rich. I'm from the International Socialist in Canada. Thank you. That's a fantastic uh, presentation on plastic. Uh, I spent five years working in a plastics factory, and it is an insanely insidious industry that if you think and look around even this room, maybe what you used as shampoo, maybe what you had for ice cream, there is plastics in it, okay, everything. And if you think about walking through any sort of industrial park, there are probably five or six small plastics manufacturers, mainly low wage, very heavy, uh, hot industry. It's, it's, it's quite disgusting. But I think one of the weirdest things lately about plastics is the idea of bottled water. In North America, there are huge fights now because Nestle, big, big, big manufacturing companies owned by Coca-Cola, the Pepsis, the Nabiscos of the world, are literally stealing groundwater mm. at fractions of a penny per bottle. 
And in the area where I'm from, one of the large aquifers uh, outside of a town that I live in, Hamilton, a fairly industrial town, uh, there's a huge fight, which strangely has mobilized people from the labor movement, farmers, people that live in nice suburban, like palatial sort of cookie, they call them McMansions in North America, these sort of cookie cutter mansions, why you would spend a million dollars on that is beyond me, but that's what some people choose to do with their riches, are actually united in a fight to say no more giving away water to Nestle, which will have a huge impact because if Nestle actually has to pay what, quote, market value would be for that bottle of water, it would not be sellable because they would have to charge $20 for that. So there's a whole series of fights that come in when it comes to plastic. But I would also say that from the start to finish, the production of plastic is one of the most toxic things we could be doing. If you go to a, a, an area not far from where I live called Sarnia, it's right on the border with the United States. It's a huge refinery town in Canada. It's also the birth of polymer production inside Canada. It was also the first place of a sit-down strike in Canada in 1930, so good for the polymer workers. But nonetheless, it also is the most toxic cancer region in Canada. It is, and it's also right beside a First Nations reserve, which is where all the plumes go, and you can see pictures, people post pictures at night of toxic plumes going over First Nations. So that's at the production end, and then it goes all the way through to the factory floor where I worked, the daily burning off of plastics from not just the blow molding machine, or not, not just the injection machines, but blow molding machines, all of these things, just creating a toxic stew everywhere we go in the environment. So even if we come up with creative ideas to recycle, we ha we're going to have to have a social society to deal with the toxic outcome of even the recycling process, even if we had built roads out of plastic, the leaching out of it, the leaching in our bodies, we don't know what the long-term effects are. We've already seen the short term. Just look at certain species that have been ingesting those little pellets, you know, in the body scrubs. That's a plastic pellet. It goes straight into the water system, all that sort of stuff. So we have to have a social system because we know that capitalism is not going to address the toxicity that's coming down the pike that new generations are going to face. If we don't get rid of this rotten system, there is going to be hell to play on this planet, which means we have to stop plastics. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make three very quick points. The first one is that I think the question of plastics connects with everything that we're talking about here at this festival, about how life is organised under capitalism. Because if you think about things like food waste, which Amy talked about, the huge um, role of plastics in food packaging, this is all linked to the way in which food is produced, consumed and organised under capitalism. You think about my, the thing that I hate, one of the things that I hate most about food waste is the little plastic sauce packets that you get, which to me are an emblem of everything that is wrong about capitalism. Why are we eating individual portions of sauce? There's no reason for sauce to be packaged in plastic in the first place, but this whole idea that you would have an individual sauce packet and that you would be eating out of that where there is more waste than actual sauce in a sauce packet, for me it's a sign of how actually the way that capitalism is organised, the way that we eat, the way that we live, the way that we work, all of these things are tied together with the question of how waste is organised, is produced, and we can't separate these questions. The second thing really is, I don't know if people have noticed how capitalism is willing to make profits out of everything, including out of people's horror of plastic. So I was in a cafe yesterday and I saw they're now marketing very expensive tins of water. So you can buy water in a tin for people who hate plastic bottles. Now I think water should be free. Water should be available everywhere. It should be clean. I mean, it's not, it's not a resource that we can't share around the world, but yet capitalism wants us to spend ex extreme amounts of money on new products that they will to appease our guilt of what's happening. Uh, the third thing I just wanted to say is that we need to collectivise the resistance. People have talked about all the campaigns, which are brilliant, um, and all the environmental campaigns, which are really energetic and topical and happening. But I also think for those of us who are workplace and trade union activists, we also have to collectivise. So just after the Blue Planet series happened, a number of people came into my workplace, I'm a paramedic, and were very upset, quite rightly, about what they'd seen, and actually became quite moralistic with other people at my station about people using disposable cups. And, you know, we're paramedics. One of the things that we know about paramedics is that if you ever have time to make a cup of tea, you will get an emergency call at exactly that same moment. So we do have cups that we can take that out on the ambulance that won't get damaged. So we used to have plastic cups. And we had a campaign at our station to say we want to get rid of plastic cups and we want to have paper cups. We then got paper cups. We won that battle. We then said, are these paper cups really recyclable? Because there's a whole other debate about the paper cups that are not recyclable, crazy world that we live in. 
Um, and then we had to have another fight to say we want paper cups that are recyclable. So this then has actually channeled a lot of people's energy into feeling some collective response to this and some strength over this question instead of blaming each other and feeling powerless and despaired and horrible. Now, it's not going to change the world. And I have mentioned this to my, my colleagues, that this is not going to solve the problem of plastics, but it does at least make people feel they're part of a collective solution rather than they're individually either victims or blaming other people. Um, three points. Um, firstly, 20 years ago, I used to live, work, probably lived, worked in an office in a basement at King's Cross, and I had the air analysed for lead. And in fact, it came out a no-no because lead had already been removed from petrol, so that's no longer a problem. Second point is Trafalgar Square got redesigned several years ago, and there was a public consultation on what people should do. And I recommended water fountains. They didn't build any water fountains in the new Trafalgar Square, which would have enabled people not to carry plastic bottles around. Third point is, it may sound a bit bizarre, but people look at what they've got on their feet when I was a young, much younger, you used to get shoes which last a long time. Could get repaired, the heels could be replaced, the soles could get replaced, and, and they could be very well designed. Nowadays, most people wear trainers. Look at the amount of plastic there. They can't be repaired. They could, and the fashion industry decides that they'll persuade you that you can't use last year's, you have to have the new one. So we've got a fashion industry complicit with that, and I'd welcome a return to old-fashioned shoes, well-designed, and cobblers. There used to be a cobbler near Paddington. I hunted him down, but I don't think they exist anymore. But I think we knew cobbler apprenticeships. Um, now, I'll just bring up uh, Amy to sum up. Do you want that mic or I can't use this one now. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone. That was like a great discussion. I definitely learnt loads from it myself. I mean, I think we have to start from capitalism has this amazing skill of creating problems and then blaming us for it. So, you know, and this goes to just about everything. Capitalism creates these problems through its drive for profit. And rather than saying, oh, no, it's our fault as a system, you individually are at fault and you have to solve it, which you actually can't do because it's a system problem. And this is nowhere more than with, with plastic. They constantly say, well, we can't um, stop producing plastic because there's so much demand for it. So if ever you hear a plastic producer, it's our oh, demand. No, it's their supply. It's their supply because they're locked into a fossil fuel industry of a waste product that they can make absolutely vast profits. And people went into it, the guy from Ineos, uh, talking about how much Ratcliffe makes. This is, these are mass multinationals making this. But they turn it around and blame us for it. And, you know, I think it's very interesting what people talk about, about some of the ways they do this on purpose. Um, you know, the sort of, people talked about a lot of plastic is hard to recycle because it's mixed-use plastic. It, you know, you don't know which plastic stream to put it in. The food trays on your takeaway uh, ready meals, or sorry, the ready meals are black. It's a very difficult sort of plastic to recycle. They have found ways of doing this, but then the companies say, oh, no, no, we want clear plastic. That's what our, produce, our consumers want. They don't want coloured plastic. What they mean is they want to brand the plastic with their own brand. You know, there's no reason why they couldn't use uh, plastic that's been recycled from black plastic. It just doesn't look as good for them. So it constantly starts from them, but they turn it around. And I really think as well, there is this question about technical solutions. You see, in some ways, you get this glimpse, don't you, of how innovative and dynamic, in some ways, capitalism has been, in that it has created quite a lot of amazing solutions to these problems, but the very system stops them being used. Do you know what I mean? This is the contradiction, isn't it? We have these advances, but because they're driven by profit, we don't use them to benefit us. And, but there can be a slight danger. See, it is technically possible to recycle. It would be technically possible to actually live without plastic. But it's also true that they sometimes use technical solutions as a, as a veneer to stop 
actually producing the plastic in the first place. So don't worry, carry on as you are, because we can produce a technical solution, a plastic that's going to eat itself, or a plastic that will biodegrade, or whatever, which it doesn't actually do in reality. But this is what they try and do, so they don't actually have to challenge those vested interests and stop actually getting fossil fuels out of the ground. And that, that, that goes on a lot of different things around climate things. See, I think it's been brilliant to hear from some of the campaigns, because any campaign that stops the expansion of the fossil fuel landscape is brilliant. You know what I mean? Like stopping the fracking. They did think fracking would be in full production by now in Britain, and it's been the campaigns that we heard about that have helped stop it. But you see, I also think we have to think about if we're going to challenge these massive companies about where power lies in society to do it as well and how we link these things up. Because I think it's right to collectivise our solutions, and I think it's right when the person talked about in a workplace what we can do. Let's always point the, the blame upwards, uh, as it were, rather than down at us as individuals and fight those... Um, better solutions, but actually, let's just think about these massive multinationals, these oil companies, the Ineoses of the world. They bring together big groups of workers that are very, very potentially powerful. Like you say, when Ineos workers went on strike in 2013, actually oil, uh, half of Scotland, was not supplied with oil. Now, they probably didn't start by thinking we're doing this to oppose plastic or for climate reasons. They probably did it over attacks because they were attack you know, being attacked. But it showed a potential power to really hit back at those people at the top. It shows how you could stop the production. Similarly in France, there was a big strike over the work law a few years ago by power workers. That's to start importing electricity from other countries because it brought it to a standstill. And I think part of our vision as, as socialists here is how do we uh, involve ourselves in those campaigns, stopping the expansion of the fossil fuel landscape and therefore production of plastic and linking it up to where power lies in society that can transform that society. And and bring those profits to a standstill, because it's also what came out in the discussion. We are for a different sort of society. There are different ways of living. You see, when someone says that water should be free, absolutely, and it used to be free. Why aren't there water fountains? We can talk about a different transformation. Water fountains in every school, in every public building, on the streets. Then you would not need any water bottles at all. Uh, let's think about our shopping. Interestingly, Morrison's has actually said, well, we're going to give you a bit off your food if you bring your own container to buy some food from Morrison's. It's this is a tiny, tiny drop, but you could think about actually bringing all your own containers to shop, to shop completely differently, to not have to eat all your individual meals. We were talking about how food is done, but do it collectively. There are many different ways of how you wouldn't actually need to use the packaging or the bags or the plastic involved in all that to live in a different way. And I tell you, once you start thinking about plastic, which I became slightly obsessed with, you do see it everywhere. <laughs> and you think, could we do that differently? Probably yes. But you see, this is about a different sort of society, isn't it? Because at the moment, we don't get to make those decisions. Someone said it. Where's the referendum on this? We didn't make a, a decision. We weren't involved in that decision in the Second World War to try and transfer all that productive capacity into plastics. But we want a society that we would be able to think about it. Some of this is a bit complex. How do we do use our resources? And what's the best way of using them? What, how do we use that amazing, innovative technology to not damage the environment, but to make sure people get what they need? And that means we need it under our control. And that's why we have to go from doing what we can right now. And like I say, everything we do to stop more plastic being used is good, because we know where it's ending up. But at the same time, point the, uh, the finger upwards at the people at the top and link our battles to a collective power that can stop that production but also be part of transforming the world on a much bigger scale so actually we don't have this problem in the first place.